Cool. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to contribute to this important conversation today. I really appreciated that introduction and reference to H. pylori. I think it's um, very suitable for, for what we'll talk about next. As, as Julie mentioned, uh, we are a uh, company developing a novel treatment for Alzheimer's disease currently in late stage clinical testing. And today I'll be talking about the data that supports this new mechanism of action um, based on, on a critical role for infection in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. We're a recently public company, so here's our disclaimer for forward-looking statements. <laughs> <laughs> I won't read it to you. Um, my background is in Alzheimer's research. I've been an entrepreneur for about 20 years, but my real passion has always been to understand Alzheimer's um, through a comprehensive hypothesis. So we know that there are beta amyloid plaques in the brain of patients, this has been the main primary focus of the last 30 years of drug development, uh, which unfortunately has, has not produced effective treatments. Uh, we also know there are neurofibrillary tangles. These are dystrophic neurons. Um, but over the past 10 years, we know there's a lot more going on in the brain of these patients. There's chronic neuroinflammation in the brain. There's microglial activation. These are the immune cells of the brain. There's complement cascade activation. This is also part of the immune system. There's inflammasome activation. This is also part of the defense against pathogens. So there are um, multiple signs that there could be an infection upstream of all of this pathology. And in fact, when people started asking, what is beta amyloid? Uh, you know, for many years it was just treated, well, these plaques are in the brain, they must be bad, let's get rid of them. Um, but really, it was important to start asking, why is this beta amyloid being overproduced? And when people asked the question, uh, what is beta amyloid, they found that it behaves like other antimicrobial peptides. Uh, antimicrobial peptides are produced in response to infection. They uh, share many properties with beta amyloid, including uh, their size, their ability to form oligopathy. Um, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of converging evidence uh, that there could be an infection in the brain uh, driving all of this pathology. Uh, my co-founder at UCSF is an expert in HIV dementia. So we know that infections can cr cause neurological disease. There's neurological Lyme disease, listeria, syphilis, HIV. And so he was looking, uh, monitoring the literature, looking, going down different roads uh, to look at other different possible infections that could be causing Alzheimer's. And frankly, uh, these come up every couple of years. This isn't a, a totally new idea that infection could cause Alzheimer's. Um, but they were dead ends. They weren't establishing Koch's postulates, which essentially are the criteria for showing that an infection is causing disease and not just coincident with disease. But interestingly, about 10 years ago, some literature started emerging, epidemiology studies, um, showing a link between periodontal disease and Alzheimer's disease. So pretty much any big epidemiological study looking at risk factors for Alzheimer's turns up tooth loss, periodontal disease, and the bacteria Porphyromonas gingivalis. And um, some of these are just correlations, of course, but others are prospective studies showing that having periodontal disease early in life, so in your 40s or 50s, is a risk factor for getting Alzheimer's later. So even based on these studies, we had an idea that the periodontal disease was coming first. This isn't just people losing their memory and beginning not to take care of their oral health. Um, also, interestingly, if you look at the biology of gum disease or periodontal disease, it shares a lot of commonalities with Alzheimer's. It's a chronic, slowly progressing, age-related degenerative disease, very similar uh, inflammatory uh, uh, properties, this low-grade chronic inflammation as opposed to a big abscess or a big uh, inflammation in the brain that would cause meningitis or encephalitis. So, um, you know, this is... Obviously, epidemiology cannot prove causation. Uh, we never refer to the ep epidemiology to prove causation, but this was a hint to go looking more into this and to understand um, if this bacteria called Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is a keystone bacteria in periodontal disease, um, could be getting into the brain and contributing to the development of Alzheimer's disease. 
So um, we've pursued a number of studies, and this has really uh, been an international research effort. There, there have been a lot of independent labs coming out with papers um, that support this, this hypothesis. Um, and essentially, I'll walk through some of that data. I only have 10 minutes today, so we'll just hit on some highlights. Um, but we now know porphyrin monos gingivalis is in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. We can see it there in 90 to 100 percent of patients, depending on that, the tests that we use, the assay that we use. Um, we know that it infiltrates the brain of animals after an oral infection and triggers Alzheimer's pathology. Um, we know that it, blocking gingipanes, these are virulence factors from this bacteria, um, has benefits uh, to the animal model. And I'll also show you some of our clinical data, which is very encouraging and supports the hypothesis. Um, and again, we're currently in a large, um, potentially pivotal study to, to test this hypothesis further and uh, developing uh, along the way a lot of excellent biomarkers to continue to track this infection uh, in the central nervous system and the effect of treatment. So um, just to point out, I think everyone knows this is a major public health issue, 5.7 million people in the U.S. and 37 million people worldwide, G growing aging population. Uh, we really uh, all, as people have pointed out, need to do our best to make a difference. So um, some people say, well, this is too simple. <laughs> it can't be just this bacteria. What about all the other research in Alzheimer's disease? And I think it's really important to, to put um, this infection in context. Um, this is a very uh, common infection in the mouth. Half of the elderly have per symptomatic periodontal disease. About 80% are infected, 80 to 90% are infected with this bacteria. Um, it is known that it doesn't stay in the mouth when you floss your teeth and, and your gums bleed. Um, that's a sign of this porphyrmos gingivalis. It doesn't stay in your mouth. We know that it can uh, get into the circulatory system and move to different organs. So. How, why would some people get Alzheimer's and some not? Well, of course, this is a very complex interaction of a lot of different things. Uh, we know aging is a factor that would affect your immune system and your blood-brain barrier. Genetic risk factors. There's a lot of talk about um, genetics in Alzheimer's. There's really only a, a couple hundred families who have true familial disease. But there are a lot of genetic risk factors that we know are important, uh, just like in cardiovascular disease, that predispose people to the disease, um, like ApoE4. Um, but also, the last 22 of the 25 genetic risk factors discovered are immune system-related proteins. trem is a microglial protein, TLR4, CR1. These are all immune system proteins. So we think um, people's variability in their immune system is predisposing them to um, this brain infection, brain infiltration. Uh, we know TBI, uh, stroke, microhemorrhage are all risk factors for Alzheimer's, and of course, the bacterial load, as I mentioned. We think the bacteria is directly causing the neurodegeneration. It's an asacrolytic bacteria. So sacrolytic bacteria use sugar for food. They're generally beneficial. Asacrolytic bacteria actually secrete enzymes uh, to digest human proteins for nutrition. So it's intracellular. It's actually sitting inside cells, digesting them uh, from the inside out, causing this very, very slow cell dysfunction and then death. Um, and then also causing all this other uh, downstream immune system pathology, which would, again, um, circle back and impact the brain infection and its ability to, to propagate. So it is a complex picture, but we think um, identifying this infection at the center of it really explains a lot of the excellent research that's been done in Alzheimer's disease and, and fits into it very nicely. So this is some of the immunohistochemistry. This is um, the brown staining are these virulence factors, these enzymes that the bacteria secretes called gingipanes inside the neurons of Alzheimer's patients. Uh, we've also sequenced the bacterial DNA from the brain of these patients, so we're quite sure it's there. Um, we were seeing this in every Alzheimer's brain we could get our hands on, so we wanted to uh, work with another group to confirm our findings. So we worked with the University of Auckland Brain Bank. Uh, they have a very nice uh, mechanism for creating brain microarrays, very tiny samples from a lot of brains and looking at them um, for different antigens. And what they found was that 95% of the Alzheimer's patients were positive for these gingipanes in this uh, brain region uh, impacted by Alzheimer's disease. And what you'll also see, this is a log scale. So below one is essentially background level. But you'll see some of the controls are infected. 
and uh, a lot of you who are in infectious disease research will appreciate this. This is exactly what we wanted to see. Uh, it's important to show carriers prior to symptoms in order to establish a timeline of infection. If we only saw Alzheimer's patients uh, that were infected and all the controls were negative, we would think, well, maybe this is a late stage event. But in fact, um, we know that Alzheimer's pathology starts about 10 years, um, 10 to 20 years before symptoms. So we were glad to see some asymptomatic people who are positive. And in fact, on the second graph on the right, you can see that as people build up these ginger pains in their brain, their tau pathology, which is a very good correlate to cognitive decline, uh, builds up as well until people become uh, symptomatic later. We um, also, actually, we have published um, some similar data of causation in animals in science advances recently. This is actually data from uh, University of Illinois. They did a very beautiful study where they orally infected wild-type mice. These are not transgenic mice that overexpress um, proteins. These are regular mice that look like a regular Alzheimer's patient with an oral infection of the bacteria. And what you see from left to right there is the bacteria got into the brain of the infected mice. It caused this chronic low-grade inflammation. It triggered the beta amyloid plaques. It activate, caused activated microglia, caused tau tangle-like neurons, and it ca caused about 50% of the neurons in the hippocampus, uh, this memory center of the brain, to die off. So this is really unprecedented to see um, a model, an animal model that mimics Alzheimer's disease so closely uh, based on such a physiological infection. So we were really excited to see this characteristic pathology in wild type mice. And we think um, it, it, it speaks to the causation, but also provides a new model for drug development uh, that we can screen drugs and that will be more translatable to human studies. I'm going to skip a little bit because we're short on time. Um, we've done a couple of clinical studies, a very typical first in man. Uh, we are now, um, we can now sequence the DNA fragments from the bacteria from the cerebral spinal fluid of patients. Um, nine out of nine of uh, the Alzheimer's patients in our phase 1B clinical study were positive for this bacterial DNA in their cerebral spinal fluid, and 50 out of 50 um, of a separate uh, observational study. So again, this just reemphasizes the uh, immunohistochemistry data that this is um, very prevalent in, in the Alzheimer's population who are well diagnosed. Uh, in our clinical study, we could see um, changes after uh, treatment with our small molecule to inflammatory markers in the blood, uh, which came down. We could also ch see changes to fragmentation of important proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid. We know that a lot of proteins are fragmented in the brain of patients, um, and that uh, core 3 8 our clinical drug, could reduce the fragmentation of these proteins, preserve the brain uh, integrity of the brain proteins. We also did some preliminary exploratory cognitive testing. This is a very small group, and again, we're doing a larger study to confirm these results. But um, what you can see is that in multiple cognitive tests, we showed either a trend to benefit or actual significant benefit, uh, cognitive benefit after treatment uh, with this virulence factor inhibitor. And uh, what's interesting about this, we, our main goal was really to level off decline, block any further neurodegeneration caused by the bacteria. But we, what we saw here was a potential actual improvement. And this is actually consistent with our mouse studies uh, where we could see that inflammation was coming down very quickly. So there, there um, are a lot of things. We can't bring neurons back from the dead, but uh, just like any infection, um, uh, the immune response is adaptable. And when you treat the infection, we could see uh, the A-beta production coming down, the TNF-alpha coming down, uh, and we believe that the neurons that are still there but dysfunctional can become, potentially become functional again based on this data in our mouse data. This is just the phase two, three study that is ongoing. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we feel very excited about this new mechanism of action uh, that we believe is upstream of multiple parts of, of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think it's a really great example of uh, infection in chronic disease, which may not be so easy to identify because the time between infection and symptoms is, is quite long. So uh, I encourage uh, everyone to, to keep looking, thinking about these sporadic diseases and uh, what may be contributing to their progression.